Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Electra. I'm the founder of The Law Boutique. And The Law Boutique is an alternative legal service provider. Uh, it was founded in 2017, and we predominantly work with uh, tech companies, lots of fintechs, and we help them with things like legal design, outsourced flexible legal support, and legal operations. Thank you, Electra. Uh, over to you, Guy. Hey, so I'm Guy. I come from a computer science background. I ran a technology company for 10 years before starting Legal Connection. And um, I look at the product from the consumer side, obviously, being not a lawyer. Um, it's a communication and collaboration tool that lawyers can use to chat and work with their clients and also to work with each other. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And very shortly about me, uh, my name is Timo. I run Cosmonauts. I run another company called Pekama. We do all sorts of stuff, uh, but we mainly um, work with companies building uh, their business, predominantly tech companies uh, like Guys One. Uh, and we run a lot of uh, conferences uh, all around the world, uh, not at the minute, as you can imagine. Um, but progressing to the questions, I, I think that I'll ask a very simple question to start with, because I think it's a question that people have very different answers to. Um, and that's, what's legal design? Uh, I think it, it, it means different things for different people. What does it mean to your lecturer? Um, so I think that you're right. There are a lot of misconceptions around what legal design means. Lots of people think that it means just making a document look prettier or making a contract, put emojis in it. But it's it's not necessarily that. It's uh, about taking a document, a process, anything really, and looking at the way looking at the way that it's structured and envisaging how how the user would want to consume that. So taking a user centric approach to whatever it is that you're designing. So let's take a contract, for example. If you look at a contract today, a typical contract looks pretty ugly, uh, not really user-friendly, not easy on the eye, lots of text, lots of blocks, not really visual. And, and that makes it a document that's not very popular. So you talk about contracts, people don't love them. I think one of the reasons is the fact that they've not been designed with the user in mind. And, and, and just on that point, the user isn't necessarily always another lawyer. The user is is a business if it's a business contract. So if you're if you're a CFO or if you're a tech person, you don't want to do loads of legalese. You want to understand what your obligations are in an easily consumable way. So legal design is taking that approach, the approach of what does the user want to see whilst designing things like documents and processes. I, I, I think that you, you you're touching on something very topical actually. I think that everyone uh, that perhaps is not very legally or oriented, uh, really is dreading reading contracts. I mean, I remember at the beginning of my business, uh, that was something that would take me ages. Uh, not because I don't want to advance to a certain action, it's just because I just couldn't be bothered to do it. I mean, you know, I'm fortunate enough now to have uh, people doing that for me, and all I need to do is ask them, well, is there anything that I should be concerned of? And as you trust that person and they tell you no, that's about good enough for me, I'll put that signature. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that on camera, but still. Uh, but I, I, I think that a lot of people, um, I mean, you know, uh, just don't do it. Um, a lot of non-lawyer people. But over to you guys. So what, what is legal design to you? Okay, well, I'm going to say something kind of different. And I've been listening to a few podcasts about legal design and also been thinking about design thinking as well. Um, so in Joburg, uh, where I come from, the five most beautiful buildings in the center of the city are actually the five biggest law firms, the Our Magic Circle. And not only are they beautiful from the outside, but when you walk in, you come into this cavernous hall with this um, sort of reception at the front, and then you send up an elevator into a beautiful boardroom. And so, you know, that's something that everyone, that is design thinking, you know, that's, that's uh, sort of creating an experience for your user. Um, and that's something that we can all relate to, you know, whether you come from a technology uh, um, standpoint or not. Um, and now, sort of as we transition to tech, and tech becomes the first experience that most um, of your clients will have with you as a law firm, you know, whether that tech is sending emails backwards and forwards, or as you say, setting up uh, contracts, documents, um, et cetera, it's, it's about taking that, that experience, the same experience that you felt at the law firm when you got to the beautiful boardroom with the nice cappuccino, and it's sort of bringing that into everything that, that happens in the um, experience. You know, that's, that's something off the top of my head. I don't know whether it's going to be a dictionary definition, but that's something. But are we, are we actually able to, to borrow some, some techniques from, from tech, really? Because, I mean, frankly, I think that a lot of tech companies haven't got that right themselves. 
Uh, I mean, like we see a lot of products that uh, are frankly shit products from a user perspective. So, you know, uh, should we like think in a totally different way when we're talking about legal design or should we be borrowing stuff from industries that have established design as a thing in a way, if you wish? I guess it depends who you ask. If, if you ask me, we should borrow everything from, from tech. I think all of the tech companies, every everything that's doing well, you know, you name it, Netflix, um, uh, Apple, every single tech company has got a huge design component at the center and, and you can almost nail their success down to their design. And I think that that's why the legal profession is now starting to look to design thinking. How can, how can we streamline uh, our communication with people? And I think that the question really will be going uh, around streamlining things internally and externally. Um, so uh, over to you, Guy. I know that you built a fantastic platform, uh, and I'm not just saying that because we work together. Um, so can you tell us, in, in your view, um, what, what makes a, a communication easy enough, prompt enough, and candid enough uh, for, for people? Yeah, look, so, you know, you know my story. I uh, went to a law firm. I struggled to communicate with them. I um, and based on my frustrations, I, I went and built Legal Connection. I dreamed or imagined that I would be in a WhatsApp group. All of us would be in with me and we would all be sharing and working together. Um, and, didn't, and because that experience didn't present itself, um, I went and created what was essentially the WhatsApp of law. Um, and so for me, uh, really communication and, and streamlined communication in 2020 is super asynchronous. We're having a live discussion right now uh, uh, on a webinar, but 90% or 99% of the communication that I do is in chat. Um, and so borrowing from you know what, what experience uh, we have in Slack, in WhatsApp, in all of these channels, um, and I, that's what I created. It, was, it wasn't something that, that was easy and that is necessarily easy to sell to the law firms. In the beginning, they looked at me like I was crazy and they said, why would we want to have our clients in a WhatsApp chat? My client's going to interrupt me the whole time. I I'm not going to know who to bill. But I think that um, even in even the last two years, that sentiment has changed in, enormously as uh, lawyers have realized that you, you've got to meet your clients, you know, really live and in the moment and, and, and got to hold, handhold them through. Otherwise, you'll, they'll essentially just drop off. Mm -hmm. so that, in, interesting enough, things that we, we've become accustomed in our personal lives and things that have become a daily routine sometimes are difficult to translate in our professional life. Um, yeah. I'm not, not quite sure why, why, why that happened whether whether you you don't want to be the first one to bring something like that uh, like this in you don't want to uh take, take the risk initially or um maybe because we we don't treat our our customers as, as our collaborators and we just purely treat them as customers um we'll be, we'll be moving to to uh our last question and and i know that you both have different perspectives on on that question um, and it's a question around uh, around the customer. Mm -hmm. Should we be adjusting to the customer's way of doing things? Should we be joining the customer's team? Or should we be bringing our customer in our team? And should we be introducing them to the way that we do things? Yeah. So uh, I, I will address the question to you first, Electra, because I, I, I really like your business model, actually. Um, I, I think that it's a fantastic model. Uh, I think that you've also um, put forward some, some very clever ways of, uh, of, of a model that uh, can be scaled up. Because sometimes with a lot of fantastic models which are customer-centric, uh, OFO uh, sees struggles in scalability. But I don't think that would be the case um, with, with you guys. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so I actually th I actually do worry about scalability sometimes because the, um, the the service that we offer is very bespoke. So I'll just I'll talk you through the process um, just so just so I can give some context. So the way that we operate is that we'll engage a GC usually or a, a senior in-house counsel, and uh, they'll say, right, guys, we need some help with either data protection work, which is quite high volume, um, and or commercial contract review negotiations stuff like that. So we'll say, fine, we need to embed ourselves as members of your team because that's how we work. 
uh, we don't work on an instruction basis. So there is no lengthy instruction process. And the reason we do that is because we found that um, one of the barriers to uh, legal support from in-house counsel or the in-house counsel you've expressed to us is the lengthy instruction process. And again, just going back, I saw one of the comments um, saying that sometimes law firms have quite a low risk appetite. Um, yeah, I get that. It is a regulated profession. So, you know, that's, that's what comes with it, unfortunately. Um, but we found that that constant having to sit down and write a, a long instruction made in-house counsel say, well, do you know, I haven't got time to do that. By the time I do that, get quotes in and choose someone, I may as well just do it myself or with my team. So we decided to remove that barrier by embedding ourselves as part of the team. So there's a bit of an integration piece there where we get an email address to the business, we get onto their Slack, we get onto their Jira, et cetera. So once we become once we become part of their team, we start looking at the way that they operate. So we look at the way that they, um, they take contracts, for example. So accepting to review a contract via Slack is not a great idea because first of all, you're sharing information on Slack then you can't get any data out of it. So at the moment, the way that we operate means that we can also give data insights. So for example, this month, we've reviewed 20 NDAs. And actually, because now your whole team is using this, I can tell you that your team reviewed 50 NDAs. Why on earth are you reviewing 50 NDAs? Maybe we should look at your NDA template and put some legal design into it. Because that's not a word that Electra, how are you, if every company you work on is working on a different platform, how are you gonna scale uh, that exactly. kind of practice? Exactly my, my, my worry. So what we've now done is first of all, made a decision that as soon as you onboard a client, there needs to be an integration piece whereby we have to, with APIs, push stuff to our own internal system. And now that's working quite well. So I think what we did before is kind of, you know, you just, you just get into the work. You don't realize that there's an integration element there that needs to happen in order for it to work seamlessly and in order for you to process the work. So that's what we're doing. Another thing that we're doing to, to help us um, become a bit more scalable is when we're responding to a question, we save that answer that we've given that could be applied across industries. And we're trying to build a bit of a, a bit of a knowledge base so our clients can use that to self-serve as much as possible. So we're trying like to make ourselves we're trying to make legal as scalable as possible and as self-serve as possible always knowing that law isn't entirely DIY, never will be. So, yeah. I, I like it. I think if there's one thing that's in common between uh, myself, Electra and Timo, it's that we all want to be uh, very successful and very rich and uh, build huge companies. And I, 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 I don't want to be rich, rich guy. I want to go to Mars, but that's a different story. Yeah, if you want to go to Mars, um, I want to get on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't know about electric, but yeah, you, you've got to you've got to be able to scale the business. And if you scale the business, you you can't be um, constantly. You've, you've got to find things that, that happen over and over again. You can't be um, embedding yourself in everyone else's tech. If you look at something like Airbnb, you know they didn't they didn't go and uh, and create a plugin for every um, you know for every different what do you call it, um, hotel and booking system and everything like that. They, they created a unified experience. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're all going to sort of uh, figure out as we, right. as we grow. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, like, really, like, if you cannot scale a business, you don't really have a business, you have a job. Mm. So the, 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 the two are career. fundamentally yeah. different. Yeah. So, He's got there are many people uh, uh, in the world who do things which don't scale because that that's the only way that we can do the things which do scale. The the thing is that I think that there there is a potential for scalability almost in any any path of work. I th I think there are variables that you need to indicate whether uh, you know and and they're and they're both technical, uh, operational, but also emotional variables. You, mm -hmm. you know, being able to scale a business is is having the ability to give up on control. Uh, and trusting people around you because uh, you know you, you you cannot look after everything. Being being able to replicate at a larger scale what you already know. So yeah. uh, you know you you can be a very talented professional in the field that 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 you cover, uh, but that doesn't make you a good business person. Mm. So um, and I I highly respect uh, those people, but. It, it's a it's a different uh, type of conversation uh, that 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 we're that we're having here in comparison to a lifestyle business. Uh, as, as I many people you've, call it. Uh, you've you've put up a new poll. Um, I have put up a new poll. Both have been going strong, by the way. Uh, just so you're aware, to our entire audience, we'll be sharing the results of those polls with everyone. 
We're not just collecting them for ourselves. Uh, sharing is caring. Can, uh, we're also the going to be. Because I can see it, but I don't want to say anything. <laughs> um we will be putting we're putting the results together and sending them out to everyone everyone is going to also receive a recording of this uh not just the presenters um so guy i mean is 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 tech in the center of uh bringing your customers um in 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 your team should we be bringing customers in our team should we be joining our customers teams i i know that you're more of an advocate of uh, essentially having people um joining the way of uh of, of work of, of of the lawyer as opposed to the other look, way around look i think um myself and electra might come at it from different perspective in the terms of electra deals with tech companies and they've each got their system and these tech companies like that's a religion for them you know whether it's jira or asana or Basecamp. Is like asking someone uh, Christianity or Judaism or Apple or uh, Android. <laughs> you know, it's a very personal choice. Um, but I think um, in the in the space that I play in a little bit more, we're often coming to fill a void which doesn't exist. You know, so we're often what we're replacing replacing is nothing, um, and it, it makes my life a little bit easier because then I can start with a blank slate. And so Legal Connection was created with this idea of um, of helping helping people that want to scale their operations and that move fast um, and really just uh, give, give the high touch experience to the client um, and work in that very futuristic way that we've, that we've been talking about where the clients and the lawyer are collaborators and, and work together. I wish to thank everyone uh, for joining us today, uh, especially Electra and, and Guy. Um, and I oh, wish you a fantastic you weekend. Up, Excuse me? Thank you for setting it up. Well, always my pleasure. Always my pleasure. Uh, I'm sure everyone's got some uh, big plans for the weekend. Enjoy them. Um, Thanks for having me. Thank you very yeah, much, Electra. Always a pleasure. Thank you, guys. You have a good day.